The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, so last time you started kinetics, which is a completely different topic from thermodynamics. They're related, and we'll see a relationship at some point. Um, and you uh, did first order kinetics, and today we're going to move on and go ahead and do more complicated kinetics and hopefully get to some interesting stuff in a couple lectures. Right now we just have to do the a review of stuff that you've probably seen before, um, and so we're going to go reasonably fast. So you saw first order reactions. Today we're going to do second order reactions, at least begin with second order reactions, second order kinetics. Of the form, uh, and then there are, two there are two kinds. There's first order, rather second order um, in one reactant of the form A goes to product. And then you have first order in two reactants, first order in two reactants. So the form A plus B goes to product, where it's first order in A and first order in B, and this is second order in A. So you can think of this as A plus A goes to product, uh, if you want. And there's some rate constant K associated with this reaction, and we do the rate analysis, we write the rate of this process, minus dA dK and uh, minus dA dT. And for the purpose of writing on the board, and you might want to do this also in your homework when you're tired of writing, I'm going to skip the brackets, okay? The little brackets that we usually put for concentration, I'm going to skip those because it's just too much work to write them. And you can understand that A is a concentration of A. Okay, so this is equal to K A squared, second order in A. And the units for K, it's important to keep track of, of your units. At the end of the, of, of the calculations, often you want to make sure your, your units work out, right? So the units for K are going to be, if this A is in moles per liter, the units for K, you're going to have to be able to match the units on this side here. So the units for K are going to be liters squared per mole squared per second to make the units match. All right, then you integrate this on both sides from 0 to uh, T, or from A naught, the initial rate, to A. So from 0 to T, uh, and this doesn't go like this. So you integrate A naught to A. You've got dA over A squared. You put all the A's on one side, all the T's on the other side, from 0 to T dT, with a minus K on this side here. And then you get your, your rate equation, integrated rate equation for this, which gives you uh, 1 over A is equal to KT plus 1 over A naught. So this gives you A as a function of time. And this is a convenient way to, to write it because it's linear in time. So you always try to get things to be linear in time because then you can plot them as a straight line, plot um, on this axis here you plot 1 over A. On this axis here you plot T. And as a function of time, then you get a straight line where the slope is k, gives you the rate, and the intercept is 1 over a naught. OK, just, yes? k is uh, moles per liter squared uh, per second. You're right, liters per mole per second, yes. That is correct, because it, it has to work. Otherwise, it doesn't work. All right. 
So um, I need to turn on my brain, right? Okay, let me think. Leaders, promo, second. Thank you. Okay, um, and the other thing that you want to know is the half-life. What is the half-life? So you set two a naught. So a naught over two is the um, a naught over two. You look for the time where you get to a naught over two. So you s put a naught over two in here, and that's going to be equal to k times t one half plus one over a naught. So you solve for the half-life, and you get a half-life of 1 over k a naught. So the half-life is inversely proportional to the amount of stuff you started out with. Unlike uh, the first order reaction, where the half-life was independent of the amount that you started out with. OK, okay. so this was the easy one. Uh, this, the next one is a little bit more complicated, which is when you are uh, first order in each of two reactants. Then your rate, your differential rate equation looks like this, equal to k times a times b. And now you don't know what to do with b a priori. Um, so you want to rewrite this equation uh, a little bit differently in terms of the amount of a that's used up. So you define a, x is equal to a naught minus a. This is the amount of a that's used up. This is what you started out with. This is what you're left with. And so the difference is what's being used up. Um, and dx dt is minus da dt. And by stoichiometry, uh, what you've used up of A is also what you've used up of B. Because for every A that reacts, you have to use up one mole of B. For every mole of A that reacts, you use up one mole of B. And so you also have uh, x is equal to B naught minus B. So uh, you can plug this um, in here and get an, a differential equation, which is purely in terms of one variable, which is x. Right here, it looks like it's in terms of two variables, which makes it complicated. By, by doing this change of variables, you see that A and B are actually related because of, of, the, uh, of the reaction stoichiometry. So you can rewrite that as dx dt is equal to k times a naught minus x times b naught minus x. So now you have a differential equation in one variable, which with some tricks you can solve. Okay? So uh, we want to have the integrated uh, uh, equation. So uh, we take an integral of both sides. We put in all the x's on one side, all the times on the other side. We go from x equals 0 to x dx uh, a naught minus x times b naught minus x is equal to k from 0 to t dt. And now you have to dig back into the last time you took integ integration and calculus, which for me was about two centuries ago, and, um, and figure out how to do this integral here. And the trick for do this, doing this integral is to use partial fractions. Okay, so you use par partial fractions to do this integral here, which means that um, you, um, you take this uh, ratio, 1 over a naught minus x times b naught minus x, and rewrite it as some number n1 divided by a naught minus x plus some number n2 divided by b naught minus x. You solve for n1 and n2, and you find that n1 here is equal to 1 over b naught minus a naught, and n2 is minus 1 over b naught minus a naught. And so you plug. Now, this in here, and instead of having this complicated denominator, you have a sum of two integrals that you know how to do, because they're basically of the form 1, one over x. Um, 
And uh, in doing this, you also realize that you have to be careful because when A naught is equal to B naught, when you have the same amount of A and B, then things blow up and you're in trouble. So that's going to be a special case. Okay. So always look out for special cases for these, these things. So you assume then that B naught is not the same as A naught, and then you can go forward with solving it. So you integrate, and at the end of the process, I'm not going to go through it. It gets a little bit complicated. You get something that looks like this. A naught minus B naught log of A B naught over A naught B. And you have your, your equation here. Now we don't really have a good way to plot it against one variable. Uh, and the usual thing is to look at specific cases and limiting cases. And there's one limiting case we we already brought up, which is when you started with the same amount of material. What does it look like if you have the same amount of material to begin with? So if you have A naught equal to B naught, you start out with the same amount of stuff. Well, if you start out with the same amount of stuff, then this doesn't look so different from, at least mathematically, from this one right here. Right? If you start out with A naught is equal to B naught, then, and for every mole of A that you use up, you use a mole of B, then throughout the whole reaction, the concentration of A and the concentration of B are going to be the same. So for the whole reaction, if you started with this, A is equal to B for all times. Okay? That makes it easy because now you can go back and instead of writing A times B, you can write A times A, which is A squared, which is what we had here. And then you have the thing, whole thing solved. So in that case here, you just have minus DA DT is equal to K A squared. And 1 over A is equal to K T plus 1 over A naught. Right? You don't even have to do any math. You just look at it. So that's one case. Another case is if one of the reactants is in much higher concentration than the other reactant. And that's called flooding. You basically flood the system with one reactant. And uh, that's something that we'll use again, um, hopefully by the end of class today. Let's say that we take, so this is another limiting case. Let's say we take A naught to be much bigger than B naught. So we flood the system with A naught. As a result, um, the concentration of A doesn't change very much in my pot. Right? It's hugely concentrated in A. There's a little bit of B around. At the end of the process, if I use all of the B up, the difference in A is going to be very small. So at the end of the process, I'm basically still going to have A naught left in the pot. Right? So during the whole process, during the whole time period, I might as well assume that A is equal to A naught. And that makes my life much easier because now, if I write my differential equation in terms of B instead of A, so the rate of destruction of B, Ka times B, right? instead of writing A here, it's pretty much constant for the whole time. I'm just going to write A naught. Okay? So now K times A naught is a constant, and this looks awfully like a first order reaction. So I can solve for it, and I get that, well, I can just write the answer because I've done this already. I don't have to do it again. The concentration of B then goes like B naught e to the minus K prime T. That's a first order reaction where k prime here is this new rate constant, this new number, which is k times a naught. So that's easy to solve also. So always go to the limiting cases because they, they tend to be easy. And if you were to go to, your, to, the full, um, to the full solution and put in this limiting case, then you'd find uh, that you'd get the right answer this way as well. So you can directly go to the easy way of doing it, or you can go through the whole process solving it and putting the, the, um, the approximation in there and do the cancellations and get this, but this is much easier. Just writing the answer down is always much easier. So it's a pseudo first order reaction. We call this a pseudo first order reaction. Okay, so we're done with the simple, uh, the simple stuff now. Any questions on, on, um, on 
first order and second order reactions. So the next step is you've got a, you've got a reaction. It could be a gas phase reaction. It could be a uh, solution phase reaction. There's some quantity, some property of the, re of the solution that's going to change that's going to allow you to, to follow it as a function of time. And that property could be many things. It could be, a, it could be spectroscopic. It could be that there's an absorption in the visible that changes as the concentration of, of one of your uh, reactants uh, changes. Or one of the products could have an absorption uh, band that you could follow in time. Or you could use infrared spectroscopy to follow it in time. Or if you have a reaction in the gas phase and you have more products or less products in the reactants, then the pressure is going to change in time if you have a finite volume. Right? So there's usually some quantity that you can use to follow the reaction in time to extract out um, data. And then from that data, you want to know what are the, what are the kinetics of this reaction. Because eventually, you're going to try to find a mechanism. You're going to try to find a mechanism that's consistent with the data. So you get data. Then you want to extract out of it rate constants and orders. All right, so let's assume that you found a way to get data. And now you've got to analyze your data. And suppose that you found a way to measure uh, the reactant concentration as a function of time. And let's say that uh, in the first case, the simplest case is that you have uh, one reactant. Okay, you have one reactant. A, so A goes to product. And you've managed to extract A as a function of time. Well, the obvious thing to do is to plot A versus time and see what it fits like, right? So you take A versus time, and you plot it. And you know that if you plot log A versus time, and it's a straight line, well, that's going to be a first order process, right? Plot log A versus time in a straight line, uh, you know that's going to be first order. If it doesn't go to a straight line, you know it's not first order. So then you go ahead and plot 1 over A versus time. And if it's a straight line, you know it's second order. And if it's not second order, it's not a straight line. If it's not a straight line, you look for some other order. So that's one way to do it. And you've got to have enough points on your graph. Because if I were to plot a, let's see, this is my data point. If I have a second order process at the beginning, it's going to look an awful lot like a first order process. It's not until after a while that it's going to start to deviate. Right? So you've got to have enough points down in time to make sure that you can differentiate between a first order and a second, uh, between a straight line and a line that's not straight. And usually, that's often a, a cause that experimentalists make, a mistake that experimentalists make. You know, they look at the beginning. They say, oh, it's a straight line. You know, work is done. Go home. But usually, it, you, you need to have uh, um, a, a good amount of, 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 of the reactant uh, consumed before you can tell the difference between first and second order. Okay. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to do this on the homework, uh, this kind of exercise of extracting the order of a simple reaction. Another uh, way to do it, if you have a simple reaction, is to look at half-lives. So that would be the half-life method, where if you can measure A as a function of time, then you know where you've gotten uh, A over 2, right? So you know that uh, if I look at the half-life versus the concentration, the initial concentration of my reactant, that tells me something about the order. Because we saw that for a first order, T1 half was independent of, of the initial concentration. Okay? And that for a second order, T1 half was proportional to 1 over the inverse of the initial concentration. So if you um, plot T1 half versus A0 or, or have a few A0 versus T1 halves, then you can tell the difference between first order and a second order reaction and see which one fits. Sometimes um, it's it, to get even more um, solid uh, numbers because 
from here, you can also extract k. Right? If you have a bunch of points of t1 hat versus a0, you can extract k, the rate constant, not just the order, but also the rate constant out of this data. You can use multiple lifetimes if you have enough data. Multiple lifetimes. So you can define, you can define a t3 quarters, which is the um, uh, amount of time it takes for the concentration of A to be a quarter of what you started out with. Okay, so three quarters is gone. And then you can put that into your first order um, uh, rate law. So when you have log of A over A naught is equal to KT minus KT, you get that T three quarters. You can solve for T three quarters. Uh, and you get that that's equal to 2 log 2 over k. And then you can do the same thing for a second order uh, process. So this is first order. You plug in uh, t 3 quarters, and a is equal to 1 a quarter a naught, and you solve for t 3 quarters for a second order process. And you get that this is equal to 3 over a naught times k. So it's um, not so, it's the, same, it's the same functional form as these two, but there's a prefactor that's different here. So here there's a two that comes in there, and here there's a three that comes in there. And so there's an obvious way to tell then if you have the t1 half and the t3 quarter signs. Basically, you follow, instead of having many reactions, in, instead of having many reactions to do with different a naughts, here you can do one reaction. You do one reaction and you watch the reactant go away and you time it. When half of it is gone, that's one time. Then you keep going. When three quarters is gone, that's another time. And then, you think, then you can take the ratio of those two times of T three quarters versus T one half. T three quarters versus T one half. And if it's a first order process, the ratio here is just two. And if you take t3 quarters over t1 half, and it's a second order process, the ratio is 3. So with one experiment, then, you can extract out the, um, the order. You can't extract out, well, you can extract out the rate constant. If you, know the, if you know the order, then you know which equation fits, and you can extract out the rate constant. The big error bar, you're always better off doing many multiple lifetimes at different a naughts or many of these just to get more, more, um, more statistics in your result. So this is the simple equation, uh, simple process. And you always try, if you have something complicated, you always try to bring it back to a one component process by doing something like flooding. So if you, if you have like uh, five different reactants, if you make four of them in very large quantities and keep one of them very uh, uh, in, in small quantities, then all the four that are in large quantities are basically constant over the process, and you basically are looking only uh, only one uh, one reactant going away, and then you can use these methods to figure out what the order is for that one reactant. So questions about um, simple one reactant sort of processes. All right, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so now we have, let's say we have more complicated reactions. There are two ways that we can deal with that. The first I uh, already mentioned, which is the flooding, which we'll get back to. Uh, and another way is called, so we have complex, some complicated reaction reactions with multiple reactants, let's say A plus B plus C goes to products. And there could be some stoichiometry in front of there. So one of the ways to deal with that is called the initial rate method. We want to find out orders and rate constants. Initial rate method. So if I look at uh, minus dA dt, one of the reactants, or the rate of the reaction, near time t equals 0, that's the initial rate. OK, 
okay, right as the reaction starts. I mix everything together, and I just as after I mix it together, I watch the process of A disappearing, or B disappearing, or C disappearing. And so in reality, what I'm doing is minus delta A delta T near T equals zero, where delta T is a small interval. So there's not much change in delta A. Experimentally, that's what I do. And that's pretty much it's essentially getting this number out. And we're going to call that the initial rate. And the initial rate is K. And at the beginning, I haven't used up anything. So all the initial concentrations are there. A naught to the alpha, B naught to the beta, C naught to the gamma, et cetera, if you have more reactants. Okay. So you measure this. You measure this R naught. And then you repeat the same process with a new concentration of one of those three reactants. So with A naught prime, let's say. Okay. And then you get a new R naught, R naught prime. Then you take the ratios of these R naught and R naught primes, R naught divided by R naught prime. So R naught is K A naught to the uh, B naught to the beta, C naught to the gamma. Then we have K A naught prime to the gamma to the alpha, B naught to the beta, C naught to the gamma, and. Um, the K's disappear, the B naughts disappear, the C naughts disappear. The only thing that we've changed is the concentration of A naught to begin with. So the ratios of these initial rates is the ratios of the A naughts to the alpha power, to the order in terms of A naught. So if you're clever about your choice of ratios, then you can get alpha pretty easily. Right? So if you choose. So if you now choose A naught prime to be equal to 1 half A naught, then um, you measure R naught over R naught prime. And if you get 1, then you know that alpha is 0. Alpha has to be 0 here. Then you know alpha is zero. That gives you the order. It's a zeroth order reaction. If you get that R naught over R naught prime is square root of two, or rather one half, then uh, square root of two. Square root of two. Then you know that alpha is one half. And that's a half order. We haven't seen any half order reactions yet, but we will. Those are indicative of a complicated mechanisms. Uh, but that's what you would get out of, uh, out of, uh, of this ex experiment. If you get uh, that, that it's equal to, uh, uh, to 2, if you get that this ratio is equal to 2, then you know that alpha is equal to 1, et cetera. So it's a, it's a pretty easy way to get the order. Then you repeat the experiment. Now, instead of, of changing A naught, you keep A naught constant and you change B naught. Or you can use a. Uh, flooding or isolation, which is the next, next process, to get the other orders, and eventually you'll get the rate constant. Once you have all the orders and you have R0, then you have the rate constant. Right? OK, so that's one way of doing it. And a second way of doing it is the way we already mentioned to solve the second order reaction in two components, which is to flood the reaction with everything except for one. So this is called flooding or isolation. Basically, you isolate one reactant and watch it. You're trying to get back to a system which is a simple system, which is a system of what reaction. So you take, let's say you take A naught to be much smaller than all the other species. You flood with B and C, or you isolate A naught. And then your rate, minus dA dt, is going to be k to the, a to the alpha. And instead of b, well, during that process, b is going to stay pretty much constant, because it's hugely concentrated in b. You can replace b with b naught. And you can replace c with c naught. So now you have an effective constant 
an effective rate constant, and then you have a, a process which is uh, uh, effectively or pseudo one reactant. And then you can use the, these methods here. You can plot A versus time, or you can find half-lives, et cetera, to get their order for. Then you can get, then you can get alpha and k prime. And if you can change b naught and c naught, then you get, you can get k out of this also. Right? So this is basically all fairly straightforward, just tedious experimentation to get all these numbers out. Okay, any questions on this? You'll get experience on the homework. There's likely to be a question on the final where you're given data and you know asked to extract out orders and rate constants. Okay, so let's move on then. So, uh, so far we've, we've looked at um, first and second order elementary processes, and we've looked at taking data and extracting out rate and rate constant, and the next step is to, is to build mechanisms. Okay, so a mechanism is, is when you take a complicated reaction, like A plus B plus C goes to D plus E, and you break it up into elementary steps. What's an elementary step? An elementary step is, is a step which happens in a single, in a single reaction. So, um, so I could hypothesize that this, this complicated reaction happens in three steps, where I need to have an, uh, an atom of A or a molecule of A and a molecule of B collide with each other to first form an intermediate F, then I want a molecule of F plus a molecule of B to collide to form intermediate G plus a product D, then have the intermediate G plus reactant C collide together to form the product E. So this set of elementary steps, where at each step you have a collision of two or three molecules together, uh, three is not so common, but two is very common, uh, those elementary steps are called the steps of the mechanisms. Okay, and and these elementary steps, um, you can also define something called molecularity, which is the number of species molecularity number of species that you need to collide with each other in one of these elementary steps. So the molecularity here would be two. You need two molecules to react. Here it's two, here it's two. Uh, if I have an elementary step which is a zeroth order in one reactant, then the molecularity would be one. Or I could have A plus A, the same molecules have to collide with each other. Molecularity would be two. And uh, the molecularity and the order of the reaction is, are connected. So if you have something which is uh, a molecularity of one, then it's gonna be a first order reaction one reactant just sitting by itself falls apart like in a radioactive decay, molecularity of one, that's first order process. If I need to have two molecules come together, then it's a second order process. If I have to have three molecules collide at the same time together, molecularity of three, then it's gonna depend on the uh, concentration of all three uh, at the same time. That's a, called a ternary reaction, and those are really quite rare. Uh, termolecular reactions, you need to have uh, your concentrations very, very high to, to statistically get an event happening where all three uh, molecules uh, collide together. So a three-body reaction is, is, is hard, and anything higher than three-body is essentially impossible. So that limits your choices, which is nice. Okay, so that's that's the mechanism, and so what we're gonna do next is go through some mechanisms, through simple mechanisms, and build up the complexity, okay? Any questions about mechanisms here? Okay, what we're doing here is we're formulating a framework where we can go back and look at things that are more complicated, like chain reactions or explosions or, or enzymatic reactions, and, and know when to apply approximations and, and et cetera. Okay, so we basically, here, just laying down the ground rules. 
All right, so let's go to our first example of a mechanism, a more complicated reaction. And what we're going to do is we're going to extract out integrated rate laws out of all these mechanisms um, and see what it looks like as a function of time. Okay. So the first, the first one we're going to do uh, is called parallel reactions, simple <coughs> mechanism. In this case here, I have one reactant, and that reactant has a choice. You can, you can think of it as a radioactive decay, an atom decaying in two different, iso in two different channels. So it can decay into B, or it can decay into C, where two array constants, K1 and K2. Okay. So you can write it like this, or you can write it as A goes to B plus C. This is how you would write the reaction. And this is how you'd write your mechanism. A goes to B, and A goes to C. Okay. Each step, each elementary step, these are the elementary steps, and this is the complex reaction. Each elementary step is unimolecular. It's a first order process. And so in all of these examples, the first thing you do is you write your rate, your rate law, the rate at which A gets created or destroyed. And there are two paths. It gets destroyed into B with a rate which is proportional to the concentration of A. And it gets destroyed into C proportional to the concentration of A, where this is 2. So you write down all the ways that A can get destroyed. There are two ways here, two channels. This one happens to be fairly easy to solve. K1 plus K2 times A, and you've seen this before, it's minus dA dt is a constant times A. That's a first order process. So you can just write down the, the answer. You don't need to do any math here. You recognize that you just call this one K prime, and that uh, your rate is A as a function of time is A naught e to the minus K1 plus K2 times T. And everything you've learned about plotting first order processes, et cetera, um, is applicable here where the rate constant is the sum of these two. So that's for the reactant. The products are also interesting to plot as a function of time to see how they are related to each other in terms of their concentrations. So let me go through this also carefully. And then when things get more complicated, we'll quickly go and make approximations. But for now, we can still do everything Exactly. So you write down your rate law for the product, dB dt is equal to K1A, dC dt is equal to K2 times A. The, the formation of B depends linearly on A. The formation of C depends linearly on A because they're both first order processes uh, to make uh, B and C. And you integrate. You integrate here from 0 to b. dB is equal from 0 to t a dt k1. a is a function of time. We've already solved for that. It's this exponential up there, right? So you plug in here a of time. And you turn the crank and you integrate. And it's an exponential, so it's not so hard to integrate. And you get that b as a function of time is k1 times a naught over k1 minus k plus k2 times 1 minus e to the minus k1 plus k2 times the time. Okay, things are already starting to get a little bit more messy in the math. And then to get c, you actually don't need to do anything because you notice that the only difference between b and c here is, is replacing k2 with k1. So don't worry about doing any math. Just write down the answer. K2, A0. You interchange K1 and K2 at every step. 1 minus E to the minus K1 plus K2 times the time. The only difference is up here in the K2 term. And those are your equations for K1 and K2. And what you find is the ratio of B to C is a constant. 
if I divide b by c, everything cancels out except for the k1 and the k2 here. It's equal to k1 over k2. And that is called the branching ratio. Okay. The branching ratio because there are two branches out of the reactions. And this gives you the ratio of which one is more likely to happen than the other one. And so if K1 is much bigger than K2, the rate, the rate is per unit time, right? The units of K1 are per second or per minute or per hour. So if this is big, if K1 is big, then mostly you're going from A to B and only a little bit of C is formed. Right? And the ratio of B and C is always constant. And so you can plot then, uh, you can plot the result and sketch out the result. So you know that A is going to come down exponentially. If time on this <laughs> axis here, concentrations on this axis here. So this is A as a function of time. That's that equation up here, an exponential decay in the quantity of A. And uh, B and C are going to come up in time, also uh, with this exponential format here. B is going to saturate at this ratio right here, K1A0 divided by K1 plus K2. C is going to saturate at this quantity here. So they're going to start both at zero. And B is eventually going to go to um, K1A0 over K1 plus K2. And C eventually will go to K2, A0 over K1 plus K2, like this. And the ratio of these two lines at every point is K1 over K2. So a simple question, for instance, that you might be of the type that you might be asked on, uh, to, to, to look at is, suppose that K1 is one-tenth of K2. Which would you expect? You'd, would you expect to have, um, let's see, so C is in green here. C. B, or do you expect, so A comes down, B comes up, let's say like this, C comes up like this, or do you expect, the last choice here, I'm going to put the last choice here, since I ran out of room. Okay, so this is, let's call this choice number one, choice number two, and choice number three. Okay. All right, so K1, the rate K1 is one-tenth of the rate K2. And that tells you something about the branching ratio. So would, do you expect uh, this one here to be the right one? How many people think this is the right one? What about this one here? How many people think this is the right one? One person. What about this one here? Okay, so the branching ratio is the ratio of the two. It's one tenth. So this is approximately, in my sketch, a poor sketch, granted. But this is approximately 10 times bigger than this, right? So that's the ratio that you'd expect. And it's the right here, K1 is the rate into B. It's slower than the rate into C. So uh, anyway, you got it right. So for more complicated, we have a more complicated process, we can, we're going to ask you the same sort of stuff, and it won't be as, as straightforward. OK, any questions on this beginning here? All right, next time, 
we're going to do a uh, finish with the, the, the parallel first and second order processes. And uh, hopefully, we'll get done with the complex reactions and mechanisms and move on to, I forgot what's next on the list, but uh, some explosions or, or chain reactions.